So welcome to this webinar. Uh, Patty and I both are occupational therapists at Children's Specialized Hospital in New Jersey. Through our work with our student program, we were asked to present the data-driven decision-making process in today's webinar and its guide in the outcome measurement. Our goal is to explain the DDDM process that guides the systematic evidence-based approach to clinical reasoning. We will illustrate each step of the process with examples and provide ideas to present outcome measurement. It will become clear how the DDDM aligns with the ICF and the occupational therapy practice framework. You will be able to start using the DDDM process to guide your practice, to guide your ability to build evidence, and use it during mentoring students and other clinicians. So what is DDDM? Data-driven decision-making provides a framework for reasoning through the occupational therapy process. It is a systematic approach that is used to guide the clinician's clinical reasoning and decision-making by using data to guide assessment and intervention. The framework is drawn from evidence-based practice and provides a means to validate practice. This was done in the RCT investigating air sensor integration treatment for children with autism. As participating clinicians, we worked in conjunction with Dr. Schaaf at Thomas Jefferson University, who was the principal investigator for this project. During the project, we realized that our process of evaluation, treatment planning, and documentation, as well as outcome measurement, was not easy to define and standardize. So over the course of time, as a group, we found a structure that provided us with a systematic approach and guide and to our practice similar to the current DDDM, and you may recognize some of the parts uh, also from the HOPFA, which is a hypothesis-oriented pediatric-focused algorithm that's mostly used in, in PT. The DDDM process is a way for us to embrace evidence-based practice through utilizing measurement of outcomes in everyday practice. It is operationalized in the AR Sensory Integration Guidebook focusing on OT using sensory integration but the process easily translates to other disability populations, age, age groups, and disciplines. We are convinced most clinicians are already doing the process. However, the series of steps will help organize and guide the reasoning process with the emphasis on data and outcomes. This is important, important in regards to current healthcare changes and requirements as it will provide clear and concise presentation of the need for skilled intervention as well as document outcomes and change in participation. Therefore, we feel that the DDDM aligns very nicely with the mission and purpose of AOTF by promoting research, leadership, and teaching to support the profession and provision of quality healthcare services. So let's take a look what the DDDM entails. The slide depicts the steps of the DDM process starting at the identification of the child's or client's strengths and participation challenges. And I'm going to load all of the steps first. From there, we will identify a theory that aligns most closely to our client's needs to guide our assessment and treatment, and we may have to consider more than one th theory that we may use. The assessment should be comprehensive and from a solid base to be able to hypothesize the underlying factors that inhibit participation. Based on information gathered and in collaboration with the client and the family, we can then develop and scale goals and identify outcome measures. Then we set the stage for the intervention and conduct the intervention, all the while monitoring pro progress and at the end measure our outcomes. So when we look at these steps in a horizontal way and use it as a table, uh, we can actually use it for documentation. You may also use a shortened version by leaving some of the columns out. In the Clinician's Guide for Implementing AR Sensor Integration, this form is available digitally, so you can use it from there. Um, and that book is actually available at AOTA if you're interested. The steps are color-coded to match the chapters chapters in that book for quick reference. All right, so we're going to start to look at the um, steps going into the DDDM. Step one and two of the DDDM process is where we gather the information to form a complete background picture of our clients. 
including their strengths and weaknesses. This is what we do in the evaluation process through parent or patient interview, obtaining historical information and conducting the assessment. Forms in the guidebook may also assist you in developing your own um, guide to this process. Um, a semi-structured interview format can be used to gather information about the child's strengths and challenges. This supports the patient and family-centered care concept as it allows for the family members to express their concern from their perspective. Some families can talk forever and some have difficulty articulating their concerns and have some actually have no idea why they've been referred to OT for an evaluation. The semi-structured interview format allows you to ask some leading questions to get the client and family to think about where the participation challenges lie. Here are some suggestions on how to phrase questions to gain as much information as possible in order to establish a baseline of function and challenge. This is important in goal setting later on. Okay, so step one, identifying the child's strengths and participation. Um, this is gonna be column one. Step one of the DDM is identifying these. You're gonna use a history and record review um, you're going to use the caregiver's interview as basic steps towards establishing the occupational profile. We identify the client's strengths and participation challenges. This is crucial um, for the DDDM process as it assists in forming the foundation for the steps that follow. This information is recorded in column one of the DDDM table. These should be related to what the stakeholders, or the parents, um, identif identify. In order to illustrate the DDDM process, we're gonna go through some steps using a child with sensory integration deficits and also a child with neuromuscular deficits. The first child is a child with sensory integration dysfunction. M is a child with autism who was referred for OT due to concerns about his high activity level, distractibility, and impulsivity. This is an, on the screen, this is an expert um, excerpt from the parent interview and where the parent described a daily challenge with M. She describes the activity challenge, the impact on the family, which is the participation challenge, and the history of what they tried at home, which was not successful. So continued, this is an example for a, neuro, a child with a neuromuscular disorder. This boy presented with a left hemiplegia and was seen for OT in our CIMT, our Constraint Induced Movement Therapy Program. This example presents strengths and current participation challenges, activity limitations, and the rest of his challenges, what he wants to be working on. So after we've done the interviewing, we want to identify a theory. Identifying the theory base is a link between steps one and step two. We're going to use the theory to drive our evaluation, hypothesis, goal development, intervention, and outcome, all the steps of the DDDM process. Moving on to step two, which would be the comprehensive assessment. Um, on the slide, I listed a ton of evaluations that we have available available to us in pediatrics. Of course, if you're working with adults, um, many more will add to that list. Um, the choice of assessment tools, though, is guided by the areas of concern based on our clinical reasoning, our evidence, the theory we choose as, uh, from that interview and the information that the parent can give us uh, about the child and their participation challenges. Data should be used to guide our assessment and intervention, and we link these together through that analysis and interpretation to identify the factors that are impacting the participation level. Assessment information can be filled out in column two of the table. Then we link these through the generation of hypothesis. Hypothesis generation starts early in the process. For our sensory case, we know that M is autism and that based on literature, children with autism present with atypical patterns of sensory perception and processing. And based on the behaviors reported in the parent interview, we start hypothesizing that underlying factors may be related to sensory integration deficits. So the theory we choose is A or sensory integration. 
Specific to AR sensor integration, we can choose tools that assess sensory modulation, so, such as the sensory profile, the sensory processing measure, but we also need to assess sensory perception, which would be done with the sensor integration and praxis test. Assessment data is at times limited due to the assessments that are based on parent interview. So we should choose, if possible, more standardized assessments that provide supporting data to make clinical decisions. For example, we very often have parents that come in for their initial reasoning seeking out an evaluation because their child is so sensory. It seems to be more like a buzzword um, going around and therefore upon further interview, it is clear that the child presents with specific dislikes. For instance, we would have a child coming in complaining about not wanting to wear the socks in the morning, saying they are too tight. While scores on the sensory profile do not reflect difficulties and uh, same for the sensory integration clinical observations, the sensory integration and praxis test, tactile localization and discrimination tests are all adequate in scores. So we have no reason to believe that the participation difficulty is due to sensory integration difficulties or processing difficulties. A behavioral response may actually be just that. If we look at our example again for our step two, which is gonna be filled out in that column two on a table, uh, for our sensory example, M's assessment data revealed decreased body position awareness per perception, decreased tactile perception and discrimination, decreased vestibular processing, decreased ability to plan and carry out novel actions, uh, praxis, indicated by low SIP scores and clinical observations. The sensory profile data showed definite difference in 10 of the 14 sections and three of the eight factors. In the probable difference range on two of the sections and two of the factors. Specifically, M showed hyperreactivity to pain, auditory, tactile, proprioceptive, and vestibular sensations. Difficulty regulating responses to sensation, also known as poor sensory modulation, and extreme behavioral and emotional reaction during activities. For our neuromuscular example, the scores for the AHA, the Melbourne, and the MAC levels were added to that column, as well as his um, range of motion and strength. D presented with a full range of motion at the shoulder and elbow and has functional supination, wrist extension and flexion and isolated, isolated thumb, thumb and finger movements were limited. He can open and close his fingers not all uniformly and has very little thumb activation. He can use a gross grasp, however, the grasp is weak. For him also, the scores for the, T for the PD are listed, which is a good um, tool to use to be able to really compare functional skills pre and post. All right, step three in the DDM process is generating hypothesis. A hypothesis is a statement that links evaluation data to the identified participation challenges and guides the intervention planning. Hypotheses reflect the theoretical perspective. Hypotheses is a data-based clinical hunch. Hypothesis testing can be carried out within a practice throughout daily, um, day, through, through data collection, synthesis, and analysis. One determines whether the factors identified in the hypothesis have changed and whether these changes have had an impact on participation and goal attainment. So per the DDDM, the hypothesis describes the proximal factors that are proposed to affect the distal participation outcomes. We're gonna explain the distal and the proximal outcomes a little bit further in the, uh, in the PowerPoint. Our sensory example, we're hypothesizing that poor perception of vestibular, proprioceptive, and tactile input, which is your proximal, is resulting in seeking behaviors that impact participation in play, your distal. The hypothesis statement guides the intervention approach to ensure that the intervention is individually tailored to the child's need and participation-based outcomes. The hypothesis goes into column three. So our examples for the neuromuscular, um, D's proximal factors hypothesized to impact participation are decreased strength, decreased coactivation, decreased distal isolated movement, 
poor grasp patterns, and decreased lateral coordination, bilateral coordination. Step four, developing and scaling goals. So key points for a goal development are based on the participation challenges and goals identified by the key stakeholders. In our case, it's mostly is the parents. Sometimes the children do participate. Analysis of the assessment data, uh, utilize the current level of functioning as a baseline and do our functional and measurable outcomes. Uh, so very often we will use goal attainment scaling. Goal attainment scaling is um, started in the mental health field. It provides a way to individualize goals and can provide a quantitative value for a patient's progress that allows for comparison of goals over time as well as performance across clients. We know that children with developmental disabilities demonstrate a great deal of diversity of functional levels and participation strengths and concerns, and this can be very challenging for determining outcome measures. GAS allows for individualization of that process. GAS enables us to determine hypothesized and expected outcomes to intervention of specified duration and frequency. The scaling process involves the calculation of equal probabilities for more than and less than the expected target of each goal. For the purpose of the presentation, I'm not going to go into full detail regarding GAS goal as it requires more than our time here to be able to teach the correct way to write, scale, and measure the goals in the GAS format. But we will take a look at how they are done. So this is the principle of writing and scaling the GAS goal where the zero point is our expected outcome. From your zero point, you're going to write the goal again in plus one, plus two, which is more than the expected outcome. And you're also going to scale to minus one, minus two, which is less than the expected outcome. So when you're writing goal at each level, only one variable of the goal can be changed so, to make it measurable. And for our example, for uh, M, our goal for him was to be able to wake up and play with toys set out for him for 10 to 14 minutes before disrupting the family. When we look across all goals from minus two to plus two, only the time has changed. For our neuromuscular example, uh, D will be able to maintain a modified tripod grasp with his left hand to hold loop shoelace while manipulating other lace with right and will tie laces within five to six minutes with adequate tightness. Again, for him, the time decreased to, uh, to achieve his goal uh, from nine to 10 minutes at minus two and at plus two, he would have been able to do it at one to two minutes. All right, now we're in step five of the DDDM. Um, identifying outcome measures. Outcome measures are the consequence of an intervention. They're chosen based on the factors and areas in which change in participation is expected following the intervention. This is going to be column five on the table. In the DDDM process, we focus on proximal and distal outcomes. Proximal outcomes are based on the specific factor, in this case, underlying sensory motor factors hypothesized to be impacting participation and the goal attainment. Distal outcomes are related to specific participation challenge and are closely aligned with participation and functional goals identified by the stakeholders, such as the parent. Proximal and distal outcomes help target intervention. Proximal outcomes in M's case are changes in sensory perception and reactivity and praxis as measured by specific SIPT tests and distal outcomes are the changes in goals measured by the goal attainment scale. Remember the proximal factors are the factors that are affecting participation and proximal outcomes are the targeted factors that are expected to change as a result of the intervention. In D's case, we're targeting neuromuscular and muscular skeletal factors. Distal outcomes are the skills, abilities, and behaviors that are expected to change, in this case, tying shoes. Step six 
is setting the stage for intervention. This is going to be column six of the DDDM table. It's really looking at ensure, and this goes across the board for any intervention, any therapist. One, we want to make sure that we're all um, having the right certifications, trainings, whatever you need to complete the actual intervention. Um, we want to ensure safety. We want to have adequate equipment and space for whatever the intervention is. Uh, you want to have collaboration with the stakeholders. Um, the whole team should be aware of the intervention and be on board with that same intervention. You want to adapt the activities and modify routines of the, of the environment. You want to look at dosage. Not everybody should be seen one time a week for 60 minutes. There's a lot of evidence showing that we want to change the dosage and how we're giving interventions. For example, the current research in ASI is showing some improvements were made when it was three times a week, 60 minutes for 10 weeks. So we want to look at the evidence to what our dosage should be for different interventions. Plan and prepare the intervention. All right, step seven is conducting the intervention. And this goes in column seven of the DDDM table. So for M, for our sensory um, child, we wanted to do a lot of the sensory motor factors that were impacting his participation. In order for him to enhance tactile and proprioceptive perception and praxis, the intervention provided playful opportunities to move the body on, under, and through a variety of tactilely rich surfaces on equipment and mats. The client completed such activities such as climbing on a mountain, a large foam wedge, diving into a lake, which was a large um, ball pit of um, pillows. The session also incorporated active tactile exploration using beads, beans, rice, bath sponges, couch balls, and shaving cream. Pushing, pulling, hanging, and weight-bearing activities provided opportunities for active experiences in which muscles must work against um, getting resistance, tension, and stretch. To help mediate sensory over and under reactivity, individually tailored sensory motor activities embedded in play and with active participation of the child were integrated into the treatment session, providing opportunities for high levels of proprioception, pressure touch, and oral motor activities. Anti-gravity control positions were used during play and opportunities to rearrange remove, replace equipment and materials based on the child's response, changes in intensity, duration, frequency, and rhythm of the sensory experiences were also incorporated throughout. In regards to the neuromuscular case, CIMT recommended based on current literature and D, the, um, meeting the criteria for an intensive constraint program Occupational therapy frames of reference were motor control, motor learning, biomechanical, and sensory integration. For him, six, he came to a camp six hours a day, five out of seven days for three weeks, four hours a day with cast on, non-affected upper extremity. The intervention activities targeted dissociation of hand and fingers and strength for grasp, provided opportunities for manipulation and dexterity, resistive strengthening act, um, activities, tactile and tactile perception, motor learning. For bimanual, it's two hours a day, provided opportunities for use of both hands with a focus on use of lower extremities as functional assist with sustained grasp. Oh, for him, left upper extremity, excuse me. So, simulated activity and the functional task, of tying shoes. Then we go to step eight, and it's going to be one that is quite important, uh, measuring outcome and monitoring progress. The clinician measures, displays, and analyzes the data. Outcomes should be measured at regular intervals and displayed for analysis and interpretation. 
And this is definitely a way that we as OTs and everyday practice can support and build evidence for practice in occupational therapy. So for our uh, sensory motor kid, we displayed the sensory profile uh, with pre and post as to how he scored on the different areas. And we do know that the sensory profile is not a pre and post test measure, um, but it gives you a good idea towards the tendency as to where the progress is going. Um, then we also have his SIPT sensor integration and praxis test scores. Same idea. Uh, we displayed the pretest of scores as well as the post test scores compared to the same norm that he had at time of pretest. The child moved up in the age group and therefore also has uh, a comparison to his new um, normative data. So that's displayed on this slide, and it's pretty easy to do if you put your scores into an Excel spreadsheet and then um, display it like this. Um, same for our neuromuscular example. Uh, we have the AHA and the Melbourne pre and post test. As well as our PD test and this pre and post. And then what we can do is also gas follow-up. And this in occupational therapy, especially with our children that we may not always be able to do standardized testing with, um, is we're going to follow up on our, our goal attainment scale and goals. The expected outcome for, mo for our uh, sensory motor case was to be able to wake up and play with a toy set for up to 10 to 14 minutes before disrupting the family. Well, in conversation with the mother, we found out that he actually achieved much better than the expected outcome in being able to play by himself for 30 minutes before he started waking anybody else in the household. For our neuromuscular example, uh, the expected outcome was to complete tying shoelaces within five to six minutes. He's able to tie his shoes in two minutes and achieved a much better than expected outcome on the gas. All right, so application. It's clear that the DDDM assists with guiding treatment process. It can also guide clinicians in mentoring students and new practitioners. It systematically structures the treatment planning and documentation for both the new learners as well as for research. The model was developed following clinician experience during the um, RCT. And after that model development, we at Children Specialized have been incorporating the DDDM in client reviews and for student and new grad trainings. Currently, there's a we have a collaborative effort with Thomas Jefferson University um, called the PRIMO program. TJU describes PRIMO as promoting environments that measure outcome, partnerships in clinical education and research in OT. All PRIMO sites provide specific focus training to students such as ASI neuromotor, or neuromotor disorders. Students are required to complete extra coursework prior to their PRIMO experience. For example, students coming to Children Specialized have completed class from the Autism Certification course. The PRIMO student's fieldwork outline is built around incorporating the DDDM from week one. It assists with building good clinical reasoning skills from assessment to outcome measurement. Within our site, we've also used it for, review, for case reviews. We've used it for new grad trainings to help get the whole systematic approach and to be able to keep a focus of what you're working towards and what your hypothesis was that it's gonna get you to that outcome measurement. So as a wrap up, the DDM process um, is a process to organize and guide your clinical reasoning. It's an, there's an emphasis on assessment data to guide intervention, and we really need to focus on um, the data driving our intervention, because as OTs, we need to keep ourselves um, sustainable in this changing healthcare system. Uh, the DDDM helps to articulate and document these outcomes, and the outcomes include improvement in underlying factors and function and participation. 
we've enclosed oh it didn't get in here oh um, we've enclosed references for um, information on the DDDM and again on the clinician's guide for implementing air sensory integration promoting participation for children with autism which has um, a large discussions on the DDDM and it also provides a lot of nice um, references for you to be able to use in your daily practice. Thank you.